again. Go ahead, next slide. And so, um, you know, we're gonna just, I'm gonna go through the agenda uh, pretty quickly, do a little bit of framing. Um, I'm gonna introduce our, our speakers. Um, the first topic that we're going to be hearing from um, Dr. Kirk uh, Emerson, and I'm gonna put the bios uh, in the chat box, but she's gonna focus on her research around collaborative governance and collaborative dynamics. So the purpose of that really is to give you kind of a grounding in the theories and the frameworks, which I think are pretty interesting and amazing. And then you're gonna hear from Stephanie Boltima, who is with me at the Population Health Innovation Lab. And she's gonna focus, kind of go a little bit deeper on um, using that as a frame, this collaborative governance and dynamics um, as we're focusing in on sustainability from a collaborative governance perspective. I know the folks that are in um, California um, with the ACH, that's kind of a, a big um, marker for you is just this uh, a sustainability nirvana that we're all in search of. <laughs> and then love to have questions. So if you have questions throughout, um, please put them in the chat box. After um, Dr. Emerson speaks, then we're gonna have a little bit of time for questions and then after Stephanie. And then we'll um, make the slides available and then we will also um, make the recording available. Great. So just uh, briefly, so, uh, you know, I'm Sue Grinnell and I'm the director of the Population Health Innovation Lab. And um, we do lots of different things. We're particularly interested in multi-sector collaboratives and diving in a little bit deeper, we are very interested in accountable communities for health and in particular, what makes them work and how we can be of best service um, in doing that. Um, next slide. So because people are coming from different uh, perspectives, places, different experiences. Um, one type of an entity that uses collaborative governance um, is an accountable community of or for health. And if you look across the US, not every state is doing this. The states that are tend to have these common core elements. Some have um, a little bit different, but these tend to be um, some of the things that are in place. In particular, um, you know, there is a governance, which is a, is a differentiator in this particular collaborative as compared to, you know, other types of collaboratives where maybe you get a grant um, and you're the prime for that and you're pulling people together. But um, oftentimes that prime person who gets the grant is the one who may make the decisions. And so it's, it's quite a bit of a, of a different model. It is a bit of a test. Um, it's a solution that came out of the Affordable Care Act. And so I think for us, it's really important that we're measuring what's working for who. And that's why these particular um, frameworks that we're gonna be sharing with you are really, really important. Um, so with that, I'm going to, I think this is my last slide, turn it over to Dr. Kirk Emerson. And um, Dr. Emerson is a professor of practice in collaborative governance in the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. But I believe she's in Maine today. Um, um, just because we work in Arizona um, doesn't mean you have to be in Arizona in these times. So you can, you're in Maine, I think where it's very chilly. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Kirk. Thank you so much, Sue, and, and welcome to all of you to this webinar on ACHs and collaborative governance and collaboration dynamics. Um, I'm going to talk conceptually at a pretty general level about one way to look at what it is you all are doing. I'm presuming you're all involved in some way in these cross-sector, uh, cross-institutional collaboratives to deliver healthcare and insurance and um, other services. And um, what I study has become known as collaborative governance regimes or systems of three or more different kinds of yet autonomous organizational actors, so not within one bureaucracy, for example, that come together for a public purpose and create 
a governance system or regime for shared decision making where the dominant mode of interaction and decisions uh, made are through collaboration. And these systems exist, you can turn, change the slide now, in a complex uh, system context, political, economic, socio-demographic context, and out of that context come issues, challenges, problems, healthcare, education, environment, often known as wicked problems because they are not easily solved with one actor uh, or with information that may still um, be incomplete or contested. So one can look at these ACHs as collaborative governance regimes, CGRs, that arise through at least four different kinds of drivers. First, the driver of uncertainty where you're faced with unknowns, uncertain future, complex multiple challenges. There's an interdependence here where not um, where the problem itself can't be solved by one entity. It, it needs a complex of those working in different jurisdictions at different levels and scales with different expertises to solve or to manage the problem. And where if you do nothing, if you just continue with the status quo, the uh, solutions will not be arrived at and the conditions will get worse and be detrimental to the community. What we call consequential incentives are there to move people to the table because if they don't do anything, they're not gonna make any progress at all. And finally, you need the initiating leadership. You need those to step up as conveners, hosts, uh, sponsors, and initial managers to get the ball rolling, to overcome the collective action problems that have kept these um, actors apart and bring them together. So if you can then visualize a system context in that gray area, not a box because this is a sort of ongoing phenomenon, very dynamic where within it drivers on the left inspire and instigate the evolution of a system, a regime, uh, a, a dynamic engagement of these diverse actors who have um, a variety of ways to interact behaviorally as independent agents, um, also in a relational way that um, relates to how they are motivated and committed to the process, but also functionally through specialization, through providing resources, leadership, information, and so forth. And in this uh, dynamic engagement uh, through this system that operates over time, they yield actions or outputs that, that indeed lead to outcomes that lead to changes in the system context, adaptation there, or perhaps adaptation in the regime itself. Pretty simple layout for those of you who understand logic models. It's an extension of a logic model approach to, um, for this framework. So next slide. So just to get at collaboration dynamics a bit, um, out of the study of many such collaborative efforts over several decades and in many different policy areas, not just health, but education, environment, welfare, um, transportation, urban infrastructure, and so forth, we've identified, and I should add here, Tina Nabachi, my principal co-author and I have written on this in articles and a book called Collaborative Governance Regimes. Um, we've identified these three different elements, behavioral, interpersonal, and functional elements that interact and cycle over time and reinforce one another. This becomes important, study after study has been finding that you need to attend to these dynamics to have a successful outcome and particularly a successful ongoing system that still relies on these cross-boundary agents who have uh, primary allegiances to their home organizations, right? Yet they're making new renewed commitments over time to a partnership that crosses boundaries. So briefly, behavioral elements are the way in which people discover the, the nature of the problem, how they think about the issues at hand, how do then, you then define and come up with a shared vocabulary and understanding of both technical terminology, but also your goals, 
your objectives, your theory of change, and how you then deliberate and communicate and engage and persuade and argue and manage conflicts, as well as finally how you reach decisions, how you make determinations together, small and large over time. So that is, that is this principled engagement, this behavioral uh, dynamic that is, that is continuing over time. And it also, it also is driven and influenced by the motivation of the individual actors, their interpersonal connections that reflect how committed they are to this process, the degree of trust they have in each other, how they understand the other people, not just feel understood, but also understand that there are differences here, not just commonalities that have to be respected and honored and appreciated. And finally, that they feel some efficacy to this partnership, that there's a legitimacy here, the right actors are at the table and can together um, in collaboration make a difference, make progress towards your shared goals. Finally, of course, where well, the rubber hits the road with resources and institutional mechanisms, ground rules, decision rules, uh, protocols, memorandum of understanding, resources, financial, staff, technical, as well as, of course, knowledge and shared information. And key among this is leadership. So these are the, the sort of basic elements that uh, interact over time. And if all is going well and these, these uh, elements are managed well, there's a sort of virtual cycling, a virtuous cycle there that propels these systems that, that still remain somewhat uh, informal uh, to continue and to prosper, to sustain themselves. We often give a lot of attention in the initial phases of a collaboration to getting along and process dynamics, but over time, some things routinize, people change, uh, leadership changes, new actors arise, and you sort of forget how important the care and feeding of those process dimensions are. So I want to just uh, reemphasize that. And in fact, that's really one of the key messages of this webinar. I want to note that there are different types of collaborative governance regimes, and most of you are working with something called externally directed uh, collaborative governance regimes. They've been uh, propelled from an external agent, a state mandate, perhaps, a directive, and they're dealing with an extensive complex public health challenge. There are only so many authorities, formal jurisdictions that can make uh, final authoritative decisions. You, ha you have official stakes, but maybe not direct stakes as patients or clients in the system. And some of that initial structure that is provided to you in the formation of these ACHs is preset. And that can constrain the autonomy, the movement, the discretion that you as actors have within your system. And that may be where some of you are as over time these ACHs evolve and change and you want to adapt and how do you do that well? So moving to the next slide, studies have shown that there are particular challenges for externally directed CGRs and you may be facing some of these might be familiar to you. In particular, with respect to that behavioral element of principal engagement, Often these terms are preset. The partners are recruited ahead of time by external agents. And that, that may constrain uh, the, the uh, dynamic behavioral interactions among you. Maybe you're missing some partners. Uh, maybe there is uh, uh, the, the, the in exchange of information is constrained in some way. So that needs to be tended to. Um, with respect to shared motivation, often people are engaging because they have been directed to participate. There are mandates, there are financial incentives there that bring you to the table that you might not otherwise have felt comfortable participating in. And that trust building among different levels of, in, of motivation can be a challenge that should be attended to in externally directed CGRs. Um, on the other hand, often with such externally directed systems, they can come at the beginning 
with lots of procedural arrangements and resources and funding, right? Expertise could be lent to the systems to form your structures, management uh, skills and you know, personnel can be provided. Uh, but that can lead to a resource dependency and to the shock down the road of your needing to begin to internalize uh, those costs of managing and delivering service and how to sustain your actions over time when that upfront early investment is no longer available to you. So that is, is just sort of the short, um, the short version of what is a far more a complex phenomenon that you are all engaged in. I can um, just very quickly mention a couple of highlights in recent research on the last slide before we get to questions. And I'll highlight just a couple of things. Um, one on uh, assessment and design. The, these, there's no, um, I would say, easy way for one cookie cutter approach to really completely smoothly capture the, um, the individual and, and, and special um, nuances of a given situation when you're bringing people together, uh, unique organizations, special uh, communities. So there is a design element here that should be based on assessment, uh, appreciation, upfront analysis, talking with those who are going to come together to be sure you've got the design right. Do you need a professional facilitator? Do you need extra education and training of certain um, stakeholder groups or partners that are not up to speed on service delivery or on providing certain technical assistance, for example. So if, thinking of these as design problems may be a way to address down the road some of the uh, sustainability challenges you're facing. Um, on integration, I wanna mention that there's an awful lot of emphasis in this field of collaboration on um, reaching common ground on horizontal engagement and power uh, balancing and everybody's at the same level and so forth uh, with this sort of sense that there's no real, no one's in charge. Well, you do need leadership and you, you know that you have to connect um, not only in your horizontal structure, but to the vertical bureaucracy, sources of funding, um, sources of real political authority in your states, in your communities, and that that integration between the collaborative governance regime or the ACH and the vertical hierarchy is something that we're still struggling with and trying to figure out how to, um, uh, how to how to integrate well so that the freedom and autonomy of those working in your uh, governance systems is still there, but it's understood and bounded and appropriately supported by the um, bureaucratic and political authorities that exist and are important. I'll finally just add, you know that resources are essential. I'll finally just add that leadership is really important. Despite the shared nature of the decision-making, the consensus, uh, building that you are engaged in, everyone is a leader at the table. You're all representing your home organizations, your constituencies, your various networks. And as such, you're more than participants. You're more than stakeholders. You are yourself leaders. And how one manages the, uh, the management of leadership and helps, helps leaders emerge and strengthen their abilities to represent their own interest, but also to represent the ACH itself to the public, to their constituents becomes very important. So I think generally thinking more and more about the collective of, of leaders, whatever, uh, however uh, rooted they are in, in, um, in service delivery or in the highest levels of the governor's office, they're all leaders here that you are uh, working with and who are representing important um, organizations and constituencies. So with that very brief overview, I'd be glad to entertain any clarifying questions you have now, and then Stephanie can dig a little more deeply into how this connects specifically to ACHs and her work. Thanks, Kirk. You know, um, Michael has a, um, a comment in here, and when I was thinking about our discussion, um, this issue came up. Um, uh, Michael, I don't know if you want me to read it or if you want to speak to it. 
Yeah, I I see it. The regime is counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think. Um, hang on, Kirk. I think he was. I think you he had to that, Michael. Himself. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Oh, nice Hi. to see your face. Likewise. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I just. Uh, it's it's an immediate. You know, language is powerful, and I. Um, I had a hard time focusing on collaboration when I hear the word regime. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. And I had to sort of check myself and be like, well, am I remembering this word wrong? And, and I you know, <laughs> so I kind of Googled it and it was like, no, you know, it's actually like literally it's authoritarian top down um, <laughs> is the definition. And um, it's, it's, it just doesn't feel congruent with the message around how to do leadership collaboratively. Um, yeah. That's all. I, yeah, and I don't, yeah. I, it's not a right or a wrong, it's just that's my reaction to it. And I, I find it, I'm, I find it curious that that's the term chosen to describe right. the entity. Right, thank you for that. You're not alone in having that reaction. <clears throat> um, regime can mean many things. And yes, it can be thought of as, yes, a totalitarian regime. Um, it also can be, can be used more broadly to mean a way in which people are, uh, are working um, and with a certain um, approach to the way they work together. And, and the, the intention here is to understand this list as an organization, a high hard wired organization for which all organizational rules apply to something that is like an overlay, more than a network, but an overlay system that's engaging people dynamically over time. So if one extends their thinking of regime to a, a, a dominant pattern and mode of interaction, then it's okay. I mean, people sometimes have the same reaction to collaboration. Uh, I have a colleague, I was just actually uh, editing her her essay for the journal that I'm working with. And um, she remembers back to the Nazi era and for her collaborators and collaboration is a bad word. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so words are indeed, as you say, very yeah. powerful. Um, and and maybe it's more, uh, uh, more suitable to an academic conversation than a practitioner one. So I often use systems or collaborative arrangements interchangeably with regime. It makes it easy to remember though. We won't forget <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I know you ha have to leave. I'm wondering if you have any reactions, anything resonate or? Um, yeah, I mean, these. I think the life cycle model is um, a, a pretty good one. And, and, and there's been a lot of study in that area um and kind of the the different relationships there um i i mean it obviously this had to be pretty generalizable but i do wonder about um you know the differences between like a neighborhood level collaborative a regional collaborative a statewide collaborative um how that the model kind of that you're you're putting forward kind of plays into that well and i didn't discuss the different types of, um, of CGRs, one of which is where people come together. It's a bottom-up bottom partnership. So that may well apply more to a community-based collaborative. And for them, they have different challenges, different sets of assumptions and so forth, working at a different scale. There's another type that's born out of conflict where, or very complex, uh, multi-layered problems where you need a third party, an independent uh, or impartial uh, facilitator or, or you know, intervener to help bring parties that are loath to come together back to the drawing board. And, um, and so that's a, that's a second type. And the, uh, the externally directed CGRs are that are more formalized initially, uh, incentivized through fun funding and grants, um, more or less preset in the rules of the game are increasingly popular, but they do bring with them challenges. 
Yeah, I think that difference between the internal motivation, like what people care about in their passion, like the theories of networks, right? As compared to, you know, here's these seven elements you must meet, you have to do this and just kind of the, how you, I, Michael, I was looking at your comment, just you're interested in, um, you know, I think supporting communities and ada in adaptive challenges, which is a lot of what we do is to, to deal with complexity, right? So I just think that's interesting about, you know, what a lot of the folks maybe that are on are in these ACHs where it's saying you must do this, but you really want to draw in that passion, right? Um, interesting. Yeah, um, and uh, I apologize, but I do have to leave, so I'm going to comment this now. And I think it does line up with, with what Kirk was saying about kind of uh, managing the internal relationships is such a, an important thing throughout, but especially, you know, you focus on that at the beginning and then it kind of moves forward um, and the emphasis is less on that. Um, one of the things that's always resonated for me from, from the research on collaboration and, and um, collective impact is the, the need to always, for, for the organizers and the partners to understand the motivations and the, the in incentives for all of the participants. You know, why are they at the table? What, what are they, when they go back to their organization, how are they justifying the time they're spending on this collaboration? Um, the money that might go into it. Um, and so the need to understand that throughout. Um, and as time goes on, it gets more and more internalized by each of these organizations, right? Like this is how we do business, we get it. You know, we've been come up through this system, whatever it is, but still to have to loop back constantly and say, okay, so this state agency is at the table or this nonprofit is at the table because, um, and this is how we are helping them do the work that they see like they need to, that they need to do. Um, and that's such a key part of managing those relationships at all times. And I think um, a lot of collaborations that go stale and we've all seen them, right? Is because you stop paying attention to that. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's paying attention to the to differences, not just to commonalities. Mm -hmm. you, you almost uh, you end up sort of thinking there's this thing, this common thing you're all doing together, but it's there to also serve what your more for your 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 primary allegiances are back home. Mm -hmm. And we forget that. And and that needs to be continually understood. And you need to understand when someone sitting next to you has a different set of pressures. They could have a whole new executive director. They could have lost their funding this year. I mean, you need to continually revive the, well, why are we here? And, and what, what do I need to get out of this to continue to sit at this table? That's right. Right. Yes, thank you. This thank is, you, uh, thanks, Jason. This Bye. is Caroline from the North Central ACH. I think one of the questions we often ask ourselves right now is what happens when our funds go away? Like a lot of our funds right now are bringing people to the table. And we like to think that, you know, the why is what keeps them coming, but you know we're also, I think, pretty realistic that that's not the whole picture. So, it, I think tending to the to that is all the more important. Like when our funds go away, and that I don't know if you have research or have observed other collaborative governance entities and seen what happens when that glue goes away. Yeah. Any insights? Well, I think that if you don't recognize the, as we were just talking about, why people are there, and if it's just because the money, if it's just about an opportunity, and there's no other benefit that you're getting, that your organization is getting from coming together, sharing information, learning, whatever it might be, creating a whole new organization, building a hospital, I don't, you know, if you can't get beyond the initial, uh, early incentive, oh, oh, we'll pay to come to the table and there's a manager to facilitate it, right? Then you've not built enough shared uh, motivation. There's not a sufficient common goal um, that, that helps deliver enough benefit, individual benefit to the groups to come together. It, it's, an, it's an artificial construct. Mm -hmm. And I think the hope behind the funders and, and the, uh, the use of the early incentives is that you will find val sufficient value for everybody. Um, and there needs to be this balance. Yes, you have common goals, but there are also a variety of other incentives that keep people at the table. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sorry, this is John quickly. I'm curious because I feel like that individual goal aspect gets such a negative connotation in these collaboratives um, because you should all be thinking about the community and the whole and not just your own organization. How do you how do you work around that? Because you know, I do get the point that you know people are at the table. The collective is is to be benefited, but we should be benefiting everyone at the table too. Otherwise they're not benefiting the collective. Yeah, and you, you could create a norm, and that's what these groups are doing when they come together and you learn how to communicate and, and, and uh, you know, what level of candor and how personal your interpersonal engagements can be and so forth, all that stuff. And you could develop a politeness norm or a norm that only reinforces the collective to the exclusion of people being able to say, well, you know what? My boss is not so sure that this is get, you know, that we're getting uh, the value out of my three hours a week that I'm spending here at the table. And if you can't also balance, understand, and, and uh, I write a lot more about this than I did originally. I was trained as a mediator where you, the first thing is to find common ground. I think now the first thing is to understand individual differences and to honor them and communicate that everyone is respected around the table and they are different. And that those have those are as important as the collective. So are, you want to be careful about how you, uh, you know, would might diss somebody because they're they're having to deal with their own issues. Well, that that's part of coming together and um, fostering mutuality is also mutual in their own individual commitments to their home organizations. Mm -hmm. I am um, at the lab. Uh, um, yeah, one of the things that we use lots of different methodologies. Um, and so as you're speaking, Kirk, I'm going to put in the chat just a tool that could be helpful. Um, it's, it's part of the art of hosting and it's the fourfold practice. And one of the things we always recommend, I think, as you're bringing together people is to set operating principles. So you're talking about norms. And this is a framework, like I'm a framework geek, I love them, that I think you can use in dialogue and conversation with your partners to help frame those. So, so thank you for, for that. Um, but yeah, let's move and we have time. I wanna, cause it's like, this is a, such a rich discuss, discussion. So um, thank you. Are we moving along then? Yep, we're moving on. All right. Yeah, we'll have a little <laughs> bit more time for questions yeah. at the end, but um, man, Dr. Emerson, you just you're you're on point. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Boltema. I'm a research scientist with the Population Health Innovation Lab, but I'm also a PhD candidate, meaning I'm working on my dissertation. I'm a student of Dr. Emerson's. She is on my dissertation committee. And so um, this, is, this is what I think a lot about and have been thinking about for years. And I'm working on a dissertation that's very parallel to the work that's done in the Population Health Innovation Lab. So it's like, you get the best of both worlds. I'm, I feel very fortunate. Um, but today I'm going to kind of build on what Dr. Emerson has shared and provide some specific, a little bit more concrete examples from some of the research that is currently underway in the Population Health Innovation Lab or PHIL. Um, so this is uh, research that started about six months ago. We um, have about a year and a half left. It is a national project, one of seven research projects supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Aligning Systems for Health Initiative. And we're exploring how collaboration and alignment among public health, healthcare, and social services, so social service sectors in partnership with community residents and tribal nations leads to outcomes in all 22 ACHs across Washington and California. So I'm gonna be sharing just some very preliminary connections here today. Um, with, in this research project, we're focusing in on two key questions. The first is how can elements of an ACH's system context and collaboration dynamics be combined, enhanced, or mitigated to increase the likelihood of achieving effective outcomes? And we're really most interested in three specific outcomes, which you see at the bottom of this slide. 
The first being cross-sector alignment or really systems change. The second being long-term sustainability and the third improved health equity. And so we're extending that first research question by asking when do certain configurations work? For whom, why, and under what conditions? We understand that what works in say a very rural community may look a lot different than what works in a very urban community. And so we're really seeking to get that depth of understanding here. But let's talk a little bit about sustainability because this is a broad term and it can mean a lot of different things to different people. So I wanna kind of situate us in what we're talking about here. So, we're operating on the kind of understanding that in order to transform systems and improve health equity, both of which are very long-term goals, ACHs must be sustainable. They have to sustain for long enough to not only achieve those outcomes, but then to continually um, reinforce those outcomes and maintain those outcomes. So a couple of the ways that we think about sustainability are first from the economic stance. And so this is what I think a lot of people are most familiar with. So this includes like financial sustainability. Do you have the financial resources to continue on with your operations? But also things like, is the ACH adding value? Is that value clear to people? So that value add component of sustainability. But there are also social components. So for example, uh, is leadership, our staff, our participants committed to the effort, are they in it for the long haul and will they sustain through the, through the process? And then also the importance of community support and the, the need for communities to want, to, for, to want this effort to sustain. And then finally, we think about sustainability at a couple of different levels. I'll talk about this more in a minute, but two of the key ways that we look at it in this research project our first, the ACH initiative. So this could be thought of as like the, the network or the broader effort, but also the ACH backbone organization or that CGR. And so we, we do, um, you know, we think about it across this kind of spectrum. But overall, one of the first things that you must think about an enduring step toward achieving ACH sustainability is to improve collaboration dynamics. So that's where we're really focused in on today. So let me tie this back to the framework that Dr. Emerson shared um, a few slides ago, but I wanna start by sharing this quote from Dr. Emerson and Dr. Nabachi's book, Collaborative Governance Regimes, that I just think is so important and it cannot be, under, like, it, it cannot be said enough. Implicit in the integrative framework for collaborative governance is the proposition that to improve actions, outcomes, and adaptation, so those end goals, pro productivity performance, one needs to improve collaboration dynamics or process performance. And this is something that I have seen, I've been working with multi-sector collaboratives for years, and it's something that I see so frequently. Everyone's so focused on the end results that there's, there's, um, there's almost, it's overlooked how you're gonna get there and measuring how you're gonna get there. Um, especially in these long-term collaboratives like ACHs, it's so important when you might not expect to see the outcomes for 10 years down the road. How can you measure progress? How can you show that you're making progress toward those outcomes along the way? So let's position um, sustainability in this framework. Oftentimes people think about sustainability as an outcome, something to be achieved. But one of the things that I love about the way that collaborative governance um, really encourages us to think is that really sustainability fits in that adaptation sphere. Sustainability is not an outcome to be achieved at one point in time. It's something that is adaptive. It's something to be nurtured. It's something that will continue to need to be achieved over and over again. Um, and so that's when one of the first things that I think is a little bit different than how we maybe usually think about sustainability. The next part is getting back to that levels of analysis question that there are different ways that we can look at sustainability. And so here is, um, is just kind of an overview of some of the different ways that we can think about sustainability from this kind of lens of adaptation. 
So at the ACH participant unit of analysis, this might be individuals, organizations, we're really thinking about equilibrium here when we think about adaptation. And this is the balance between stability and change for those individuals, for the organization. Our performance question here could be, do adaptations to outcomes enable participants to find dynamic equilibrium and strengthen organizational resilience? Then we, when we look at the ACH or CGR level, we're, we start to talk about viability or the capacity to continue generating outputs, outcomes, and other ACH related work. The question we might ask here is, does adaptation increase the operational and financial capacity of the CGR in ways that will continue to support collective action? And finally, we get to the target goal, that kind of like end result um, level, which that's where we finally look at sustainability. And here, this is the ability for targeted effects to be sustained through adaptive responses. Here we ask, are the demonstrated effects robust, resilient, and lasting over time? So keep this in mind that we can look at sustainability at different levels, and especially in ACHs and other collaborative groups that have these really lo big long-term outcomes, it's, it's so important to look at sustainability at these different levels. So let's dig into that a little bit with some preliminary findings from um, a, the survey that is part of this research. Um, these are, you know, I really am basically very preliminary is all I'm trying to say. But let's start at the participant level where we're looking at equilibrium. So like what, what's the balance of kind of that give and take between the collective goal and the individual organizational goals? So here we saw that um, there's a pretty high level of equilibrium in ACHs that was reported by participants. 79% of survey respondents said that, uh, that working with their region's ACH helps their community, their organization, or their tribe achieve its own goals. So that's awesome to see. But then when we look at the full spectrum of collaboration dynamics, and we think about all of the different indicators of these collaboration dynamics. In this preliminary data, we see two indicators that really stand out as being um, super important and related to this equilibrium indicator. I won't go into any of these findings in too much depth, mostly we just don't have time. Um, but the two that really stand out so far for equilibrium are shared motivation and capacity for joint action specifically these indicators of participants feeling that participating in the ACH is a worthwhile use of their time. And also by capacity for joint action, participants saying that they've gained access to new sources of knowledge by participating in ACH. We're seeing that these indicators have a um, very strong positive association with equilibrium in the ACH. From there, let's talk a little bit about viability, which is at the ACH or CGR level. We saw a little bit of a different story here where there's still you know, a fair amount of viability that we see in ACHs with 55% of survey respondents saying that their ACH is far along with identifying the financial resources needed to sustain the ACH's work. When we unpack that a little bit and look at the collaboration dynamics ac across the spectrum, we see that capacity for joint action is huge here for it when it comes to achieving viability. So in particular, these two indicators are standing out as some of the most important. First, that ACHs track their progress on increasing health equity. And second, that they make meetings accessible to everyone. And so these things both are also um, strongly positively associated with achieving viability in an ACH. And then last, when we get to long-term sustainability, that ultimate, you know, like results that is um, at the, the kind of end of the road for adaptation, but not really the end of the road because it's continual, it's cyclical um, and it's adaptive. Some of the things that we'll be looking for in you know, the next year or so as we continue this research are whether or not an ACH continues their work after startup funding ends. 
Then also whether or not any improvements that were made in health equity are sustained over time, whether or not that continues. And then also any positive system changes that we see, whether or not those continue on. But really, this is something that, you know, when we think about the long-term sustainability of ACHs, that's not something that we can fully investigate until, you know, maybe five, 10 years down the road, realistically, like 20 years down the road, maybe a century. You know, that's, that's where we get at the true adaptive sustainability. So some of the takeaways that, I've, that I hope you've gotten from this, this whole thing is first that sustainability isn't an outcome to be measured and achieved at a single point in time. It is ongoing, it is adaptive. Second, that sustainability can and should be measured at different levels of analysis. That really, it's so important to think about sustainability at that participant level, at the ACH organization level, as well as that kind of big target goal of sustainability. And finally, that we can measure this, we can see this empirically, that collaboration dynamics have strong measurable associations with sustainability indicators. And that especially at this early time in ACHs, you know, ACHs have only been operating for a handful of years, um, that it's so important to nurture these collaboration dynamics in pursuit of that long-term sustainability. Um, that that will really be key overall. So now I believe we have a few minutes left. I'm gonna hand it back to Sue to guide us in some discussion to close out. Sorry, do you wanna stop screen share? I'd yep. love it if um, people um, would, Sue, you get a prize because we get to see you for those folks just so we can see your beautiful faces, but um, thank you. I mean, I love this framework. I think it really is interesting. And um, I, as I said earlier, I'm kind of a framework geek, but I'd love to hear questions, reactions, um, anything that maybe you're sitting with or not clear, just any, any reactions. And welcome to my Vermont friends. I'm very excited you're here. <laughs> So. Okay, well, super honestly, one of the things I jotted down to John was how in the world would we track our progress on health equity? <laughs> I know there are ideas out there, but I'm sure that's a wicked measurement problem in and of itself. It sure is. But Caroline, I, I actually, um, first, it's great to see you. Um, but there, there are a lot of great resources out there. And, you know, similarly with sustainability, there are so many different ways to think about how you measure health equity. And so, you know, you can start at kind of the level of health disparities. And that's something that's much easier to do. The, the data are more readily available to look at health disparities. But then there are different ways to think about health equity as far as equity to access of care, um, equity in um, how services are uh, made available or distributed in communities. So just as with sustainability, there are so many different ways to think about it. But I do, um, there's actually the, the Funders Forum on Accountable Health. They are the kind of national group that, um, that ha has a, kind of financial interest, I guess, in ACHs. And they came out recently with a guide for how to measure health equity in ACHs. So I will be sure to, let's say, I'll actually, I'll find that right now and put it in the chat, but I'll also make sure that that's- Stephanie, I'll get it. I'll, I'll okay. get it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Sue. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, this is John. I'll show my video since I'm hiding. Um, <laughs> You know, we've always dealt with as a large region, how do you attribute, you know, progress to the work you do? And I think it's really easy when like, and we've kidded around about this, I think Caroline's mentioned it, that, you know, if a measure is improved, we take full credit for it. If a measure doesn't improve, we explain all the reasons why something else really impacted it. Um, so how, when, when, you're, when you're focused on these huge things that have so many impacts on it, how do you, how do you really attribute your impact to it? Or, you know, 
do we need to be more honest with ourselves in saying that we need to be digging into every influence and every factor and not just staying in our silo? Like, what have you guys learned on that? I have some thoughts, but Dr. Emerson is, I, I, I would love to hear Dr. Emerson's thoughts first, personally. Such a great question. Um, it really speaks to the heart of accountability, doesn't it? And uh, the value of performance measurement. So as Stephanie was saying before, there are lots of ways to measure things. And uh, some are hard and some are, are easier and some are more directly related to the question you're actually asking. Uh, and some are quite indirect. And this whole question of attribution is so important. There's so many influences acting on whatever your, your target population, um, uh, client needs, and so forth. So uh, I think it's important to think about this level of analysis that Stephanie raised. Uh, what performance for whom? For the clients, for the, um, the individual organizations, for this, the group as a whole? You obviously have more control over how the, the ACH itself is operating um, how resources are flowing through it, how people are perceiving the benefits that their own organizations are getting. So you might be able to get measurements through surveying your participants about their organizations. And so the best you can say there is that, you know, a high percent of those involved attribute to this group uh, some, some outcomes or some output that benefits our organization and be honest about that. These are perceptions, right? Um, but also then try to see if, if there are any relevant objective measures uh, beyond surveying and interviewing that can be useful. Milestones, for example. You're charting progress towards an outcome. You, don't, you can't measure your outcome, your long-term sustainability goal, but perhaps you are in a different place than you were six months or a year ago, and, and you can engage your staff, the, the, the community, the group in what made a difference. But you're right, this is a, this is a, a major research question as well as an accountability question for the group. I, I will just build on that um, by first acknowledging that this is tough and also the work that you all, I just wanna commend you all because the work that you're doing is tough. And there's a lot that we still don't know about it, which is you know, part, of, part of why this study is happening. Um, but there are a couple of things that, um, that I think can be really useful. The first is, as Dr. Emerson mentioned, you know, you can ask about direct attribution. And so I think that some of you have seen this, where on surveys, we might ask, um, has the ACH helped increase collaboration for your organization? Or gaining new access, or gaining access to new knowledge as a result of participating in the ACH? And so being really careful about that wording saying on, on surveys to make sure that it is um, directly attributable to what the ACH has been doing. But from there, um, it's also really important since we are talking about these different levels of analysis and funders oftentimes don't really, um, they don't care as much about the performance measures. It can be really important to do two things. The first is to use different types of data. The, so if you have survey data that says, wow, yes, um, everyone on this survey says that our collaboration across sectors has increased and it's because of participating in the ACH, that's great. But then if you have an opportunity to speak with the people who are involved in your ACH and to get it, so like qualitative data, so quotes, um, their stories, supplementing that data with stories is so powerful. And so, and that can be something that really raises a, or like elevates that quantitative understanding of how, what, what the ACH has done to contribute to individual participants if you supplement it with stories. Um, the second and something that I really, I've, I've been in research for the last decade and I didn't really understand this until starting um, work in a PhD program was connecting these things with theory. 
because a lot of times, especially if you're thinking about performance and you're thinking about, we can't really measure this outcome for 10 years out. So how are we going to show progress on this outcome? What you can do is you can go to the literature, you can go to theory and you can go to past research and say, we know empirically that, um, that if we have strong shared motivation in our ACH, that down the road, this will help us achieve our end goals. We know this, you can point to research for the last decades that points to this. And then you can say, okay, we can't measure health equity yet, but we can show, we can demonstrate that we have a high level of shared motivation in our ACH. And here's all the research that's been done in the past that shows that if we have a high level of shared motivation, we are very likely to achieve our end goal of improving health equity. And so tying it into theory and, um, and past research can also go a long way in helping to elevate um, the perception of those kind of performance measures. That's what I got. <laughs> I am thinking, I know Christina's on, uh, for our last um, open space that we did, it was focused on equity. And I think she did a nice job of placing where we're seeing, I think operationalizing equity in the social ecological model. I think I'm getting that right, or the prevention spectrum, which we could share if you haven't seen that. Because I hear a lot, I think, Currently, um, the sites are trying to figure out how do I operationalize it? Maybe, I, I don't know. So I think this is really interesting about this, the metrics of it, right? It's, it's and how do you actually know it's happening? Um, and what do you get to? And it just strikes me probably at the beginning, it's very process um, widget type uh, moving towards a nirvana that we all wanna, wanna get to. Um, so we are at time. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> um, so we will be, um, you know, making the slides available uh, and uh, the recording. And so I will make sure to get that out. And it looks like we have some resources. Stephanie, do you want to speak to that or Kirk? Sure. I dropped these in, but Kirk, you might have more to say about these. So. Here first is um, just a, a wonderful article written by Dr. Emerson, and Dr. Hibachi. Um, and, and Kirk, I've always wondered this. How do you say Stephen's last name? Uh, oh, you're muted. Stephen Balo. Balo, okay. I, I've wondered that for years now. Um, <laughs> so this is a, an open source article, meaning that you can access this for free, which is not the case with a lot of um, scientific research, um, but it's there ready for you to, to dig into and enjoy. Um, also, this book, Collaborative Governance Regimes, is just amazing. It includes a lot of different indicators, ways of thinking about performance measurement, um, and digs into this in just much more depth. And then finally, the University Network for Collaborative Governance has a wonderful um, collection of tools and resources specifically around collaborative governance in practice. And so there's everything from um, mediation, collective action, agreement seeking, civic engagement, and more there. And so I just wanted to make sure you all know about that because there really is just a plethora of wonderful resources there. Um, but I, that's, that's what I have. Dr. Emerson, did you have anything else to say about these or any other places you would guide people to look? Um, well, I mean, uh, that, those are great starts. You, I would also want to underscore you, uh, UNCG, University Network for Collaborative Governance, for lots of uh, resources, but also look at the network itself, and you'll find there are experts in collaborative engagement in many states, some 30 different um, partners working in universities doing practice and research and teaching, and you might find one if you don't know uh, in your own backyard. <laughs> and I'm sure they would be able to, to talk with you and be more than interested in learning about what you're engaged in and the challenges you're facing. So check out that network itself. Great. Um, thank you very much. I think uh, we are planning, we don't have a date yet, but we want to do a web discussion similar to this on network analysis 
because um, um, I think that's uh, an important piece. So uh, more to follow. And thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye.